The Upper Midwest is the heartland of America. At the source of the Mississippi River, in northern Minnesota, the river flows through a landscape dotted by forests, farms, and cities. It is the responsibility of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, St. Paul District, to manage navigation on the river and its tributaries, from its headwaters in northern Minnesota to Lock and Dam No. 10 at Gutenberg, Iowa. The Corps of Engineers has shaped the river and the region's history since the establishment of the St. Paul District Office in 1866. Brevet Major General Governor Kemble Warren, a civil engineer and hero of the Battle of Gettysburg, served as the St. Paul District's first commander. Following the Civil War, the Chief of Engineers assigned Warren to explore the Upper Mississippi. Upon his arrival in St. Paul, Warren, who had been a surveyor for the Army before the war, opened an office and began surveying the river and its tributaries. Writing to his then pregnant wife, Emily, Warren said he didn't feel she would enjoy the boat trip to this booming Western prairie town as there was no decent food on the boat and the mosquitoes were terrible. Warren's orders directed him to examine the Mississippi with a view to ascertaining the most feasible means of economizing the water of the stream or ensuring the passages of boats drawing four feet of water. To do this, he looked into constructing a four-foot deep navigation channel. Thus began the first mission of the St. Paul District. Improving navigation on the upper river facilitated bringing timber, crops, and other goods from the innermost regions of the Midwest down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Goods were loaded and unloaded in the river towns along the way, expanding commerce. The navigation mission would spread to Lake Superior and briefly to the Red River of the North, Lake of the Woods, and the Rainy River. In 1869, Warren's St. Paul office took on its second mission, emergency response, by saving the falls of St. Anthony in downtown Minneapolis. Two Minneapolis millers, John Merriam and William Eastman, were attempting to build a flour mill on the east side of the river on Nicolet Island. By 1868, all of the space around St. Anthony Falls was occupied with mills. There was simply no more room to put additional mills at St. Anthony Falls. In order to obtain water to run their mill, they constructed a tunnel under the falls. When nearly complete, the tunnel collapsed. They were excavating into sandstone, and the water seeped in there and created a huge whirlpool. It quickly destroyed two buildings located near the river. With the whirlpool eroding more of that sandstone, it threatened the falls. If they lost the falls, there would be no more water power for the mills, and of course the economy of this area would basically collapse with the falls. The public rushed to the scene. Volunteers made wide rafts by fastening logs together from the lumber mills. They floated them over the whirlpool and sank them with rocks and bricks in an attempt to plug the hole. This exhausting effort worked, but only for one day. The whirlpool reformed, and the falls would again disappear into a series of rapids. If left unchecked, all of the mills would soon be without a source of power. After several attempts to plug these whirlpools, they finally, the local business folks, called the Corps of Engineers to seek their expertise. The Corps of Engineers examined the St. Anthony Falls area. They realized that the limestone bedrock, which is the cap of the falls, gave out just upstream of the falls. And with the continued erosion, of course, that would 
extinguish the falls, it would just be a series of rapids. There would be no more water power available for the mills. The Corps came up with three features to preserve the falls. One was a horseshoe and roller dam above the falls. Another was a wooden apron over the falls themselves. Now it's concrete. And then finally they built an underground dike above the falls, 40 feet wide, into that sandstone. And that stretched the width of the river. And with those uh, three features that basically held the falls in place where they are today. The preservation of the falls represented the St. Paul District's first emergency response. This mission has evolved to responding to floods, droughts, and other disasters. Under natural river conditions, steamboating on the upper Mississippi River was problematic due to seasonal low flows, sunken trees, and other debris. To maintain a deep enough and wide enough navigation channel, the Corps had to keep the river free of debris in a process called snagging and by scraping or dredging sediment off the bottom of the riverbed. The Corps also built a series of wing dams or long fingers, which extended from the banks of the river toward the middle. This directed the flow into the center to naturally increase the depth of the channel. During this time, the Corps also explored the possibility of storing water in reservoirs in the Mississippi Headwaters region for release during low flow periods and drought. It was believed the release of this water would allow for reliable navigation and consistent flows for the mills. Rivertown communities thought enhancing the river's flow would restore competition in the region's transportation industry, which at the time was virtually monopolized by the railroads. Because of this, in 1880, Congress directed the Corps to construct a series of reservoirs in the headwaters. Construction of the first dam at Lake Winnebagashish began in 1880. Construction of Pokegama and Leech Lake dams began in 1883. Despite delays due to lack of roads, severe winter weather, and the need to work around heavy logging activities, the three dams were completed by 1884. A fourth dam on the Pine River at Cross Lake was finished in 1886. These four dams created the nation's first series of reservoirs designed to operate as a system. Their success in providing water downstream encouraged the Corps to continue with the project. A fifth dam was completed at Big Sandy Lake by 1896. A sixth and final dam at Gull Lake was completed in 1912. However, commercial interests still demanded a deeper navigation channel. At the beginning of the 20th century, traffic and milling were declining on the upper river. The lumber industry, the river's primary user at the time, had exhausted the region's forests. Competition between the railroads and river navigation was fierce. At the same time, shipping on the lower Mississippi below St. Louis was booming. New towboats and barges with drafts of eight and a half feet could haul two to four times as much cargo as freight trains. These new vessels, however, could not work in the shallower river above St. Louis. Upper Midwest businesses could no longer compete, so they began to lobby Congress for navigation improvements. After much lobbying, Congress authorized the Corps to construct a navigation system which included locks and dams and a nine-foot navigation channel between Minneapolis and St. Louis. Lock chambers at each dam would raise vessels from the lower pool to the upper pool or lower them when traveling downstream. Essentially, these locks would create a stair step of water from St. Louis to Minneapolis. 
The Corps began constructing these locks and dams in the early 1930s, completing them in 1938 after only seven years. The project was one of the largest and most ambitious engineering endeavors of the 1930s. Upper and Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dams in Minneapolis were added in the 1960s. After completing the system, the Mississippi Headwaters Reservoir Dams lost their importance to downstream interests. However, the dams remained vital to the region's infrastructure as a source of blood risk reduction and recreation. Dredging, the other important component of maintaining the navigation channel, was and continues to be managed out of the district's boatyard in Fountain City, Wisconsin. This is where the district has docked its large fleet of support vessels. The Dredge Thompson and her sister Dredge, the Rock Island, were the largest cutterhead dredges in the Corps of Engineers fleet. The Thompson, christened in 1937, was named after William A. Thompson, a Corps employee from 1878 through 1928. Through nearly seven decades of service, the Thompson and her crew could be seen on the Illinois, Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio rivers maintaining the navigation channel. After nearly 70 years, she was retired in 2005 and replaced by the Dredge Getz and her support vessels, including the motor vessel General Warren and the quarters boat William Taggetts. In the early 1940s, the district supported the war effort. In order to provide munitions for the Allies, the Army began constructing small arms ammunition plants around the country. They gave the St. Paul District the mission to construct a plant in New Brighton and Shakopee, Minnesota. The New Brighton plant was to be one of the world's largest suppliers of 30 caliber and 50 caliber shells. The plant produced shells less than five months after construction began. In September 1942, the Secret Service came to the district and asked Commander Major Lynn Barnes to build a series of ramps at the New Brighton plant because visitors would be coming to inspect the production line. Major Barnes asked if the visitors had proper military clearance. He was told that they had the highest clearance in the land. Later that evening, President Roosevelt toured the plant. A longer-lasting assignment came at the close of World War II. The Chief of Engineers asked the district to organize a special task force to study the effects of permafrost. In 1945, a field office was established at Northway Airport in Alaska, 630 miles northeast of Anchorage. This research effort, considered an emergency operation vital to the Cold War, was transferred to the Corps' Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory in 1950. Additional wartime missions included constructing a Minnesota River Port for Cargill Corporation to build Navy tankers and an Army Air Corps radio station in Toma, Wisconsin. The district also expanded and improved airports in Fargo and Devil's Lake, North Dakota. As the war ended, the Corps resumed its focus on water resource missions. Congress had passed the 1936 General Flood Control Act, which authorized the government to spend money on dam, levee, and flood wall projects. As a result, the St. Paul District was approached by many communities to develop solutions for water-related engineering problems. The district designed and constructed its first levee project in 1950 on the Dry Run River near Decorah, Iowa. Record floods since the 1950s have led to the building of numerous flood risk reduction projects. A few of the Mississippi River Basin projects include St. Paul, Winona, La Crosse, Rochester, and Mankato. Flooding along the Red River of the North resulted in large projects such as Wapaton Breckenridge 
and Grand Forks East Grand Forks. An additional St. Paul District project of interest includes completing the nation's first federal non-structural flood risk management project in 1978, when it relocated the community of Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, out of the floodplain. The St. Paul District's most recent large project followed Hurricane Katrina in 2005, when Congress directed the Corps to design and construct a hurricane risk reduction system for New Orleans. The St. Paul District managed the 22-mile-long, $1.5 billion St. Bernard Parish portion of this system. The project included engineering the Bayou du Pre vertical lift gate, which is a component of the surge barrier, the largest project in core history. As public interest in recreation and the natural environment grew in the 1960s, the Corps received yet another mission. Congress authorized the Corps to construct recreation areas at its facilities. The district developed campgrounds, day use areas, boat ramps, and swimming beaches around the bodies of water it managed. Today, the St. Paul District has more than 40 recreation areas open to the public. These sites range from public landings along the Mississippi River to lock and dam visitor centers to full service campgrounds at its dams in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. These recreation facilities add to the local economy by creating jobs and generating revenue. While the interest in recreation was blossoming, the environmental movement began influencing how the Corps operated. The nation increasingly recognized rivers, lakes, and wetlands to be valuable elements of the natural environment. The St. Paul District began designing projects with the environment in mind. This also included bringing the public into the planning process. The district established an environmental and cultural resources planning team and a natural resources management office to protect the public lands it managed. From the beginning of the environmental movement to today, the St. Paul District has been a leader within the Corps of Engineers in environmental stewardship. District employees worked on the Great River Environmental Action Team, or GREAT for short, during the 1970s to explore how navigation and dredging could continue in concert with environmental and recreation interests. This team served as a nationwide example of how multiple agencies could work together to improve the environment. Other environmental studies and programs soon followed. I think it's important because, you know, habitat is being lost. It's a huge river, it's a huge amount of habitat, and it's been lost, a lot of it's been lost over the last 80 years, will be continue to be lost unless we do something about it. And it's, it's a resource that's been used by a lot, of, a lot of folks over a lot of years. In 1986, the Upper Mississippi River Environmental Management Program authorized the Corps to explore options to enhance habitat along the river. The Environmental Management Program is a, is a multi-district, multi-agency uh, program. It involves St. Louis District of the Corps of Engineers, Rock Island District, and St. Paul District including the Department of Interior, which is the USGS service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as, long, as well as the five states, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. Well, the value, I guess, is to many users. If you're a fisherman that lives on the river, or if you're a fisherman that comes up from a southern state to come fishing, to come hunting, just to recreate, I mean, it's uh, people can come up all the way from New Orleans and you know, that's, it's a valuable resource, not only for its recreational aspects, but hunting, uh, economic, uh, to individual towns and cities who rely on folks to, you know, stay at their hotels, their marinas, but also, a, you know, a national flyway, international flyway of wildlife and, uh, and you know, turtles and all kind of, you know, water uh, you know, animals and fish uh, that people, you know, don't necessarily have to fish for, but to have nature there and protected 
is, I think most people would say, is what they'd like to see. The program included constructing and monitoring habitat restoration projects. To date, the district has completed 26 projects, improving 62 square miles of river and floodplain habitat. The span of my career working on the river started in 2000, and just in that little bit of time, I may have been able to work on five or six projects which may be reestablished 10,000 acres of habitat in a large river system. And that's something that I can always take away. They'll always be there. That's what I'll remember most. With the passage of the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, the Corps' wetland regulatory program evolved to encompass a large portion of the district's environmental mission. The intent of the program was to protect the nation's aquatic resources. Wetlands in particular provide many important functions. They increase water quality, they reduce flooding, they protect shorelines, they provide wildlife habitat, and they provide recreational and cultural value. The Mississippi River Delta ecosystems alone provide between 12 to 47 billion in public benefit every year. The Corps began hiring biologists, ecologists, and other scientists to examine permit applications for projects impacting wetlands and navigable waters. The purpose of the Corps permit program is to protect the integrity of the nation's waters while allowing reasonable development through fair, flexible, and balanced permit decisions. Because Minnesota and Wisconsin have so many rivers, lakes, and wetlands, the St. Paul District's regulatory program became the third largest in the Corps. Since Major Warren first established the St. Paul District in 1866, the district has provided outstanding engineering expertise to its customers. From the construction of the Headwaters Reservoirs, to supporting the completion of the New Orleans Hurricane Protection Project, district employees have served and continue to serve the nation. The St. Paul District has contributed to developing the upper Midwest economy as well as regulating, preserving, restoring, and protecting wetlands, rivers, and other natural resources for the enjoyment of future generations. The engineers and scientists of the St. Paul District stand ready to serve the nation from a foundation of expertise built on 150 years of dedicated service.